in some specific position to be recorded or I can move it. I can move myself. I can move. Okay. So, uh, good morning everyone and uh, uh, welcome back. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed uh, uh, day one of the conference, both the technical and the uh, social part. Uh, it's now time to uh, kick off uh, day two and uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, today's uh, plenary speaker, uh, Professor Stefano Masci from the University of Siena uh, in Italy. Um, Professor Masci graduated uh, from the University of Florence and has been uh, uh, with the University of Siena uh, for the past 20 years. Uh, it would take me a long time to go through the uh, massive list of his uh, uh, achievements, uh, both as a scientist and uh, as an educator. So let me just mention a couple of them. Uh, he's a Nitropoli Fellow. Uh, he received uh, the Europe Award uh, from the uh, European Association on Antennas and Propagation and from uh, uh, the IEEE Antennas and Propagation Society. He has received the uh, Thai Award as a um, uh, distinguished educator and the Shelkun of Prides for the best paper in the uh, transactions. Uh, Stefano is uh, uh, among the pioneers and uh, leading experts in the field of uh, uh, metasurfaces and his special focus is on uh, antenna applications and uh, this also happens to be the subject of uh, uh, his lecture today. So Stefano, please. Thank you very much uh, Vincenzo, I appreciate uh, I'm very happy to be here as the fourth time that I'm visiting Alto for various reasons uh, for a conference. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, academia. I'm uh, very pleased uh, to be in front of you today. Uh, the focus of this talk is uh, today about antenna. I'm sorry for the physicists that may expect something different, uh, but uh, this is my field of action. And uh, I believe that uh, some of the techniques that we use for antennas could be also useful for optics uh, or for nanomaterials, uh, nanostructural materials. Uh, I'm coming from University of Siena. Uh, this is the, the group uh, in my university. Actually, uh, some of these persons are moved in another university now. For example, uh, Barrio Mencagli, David Gonzalez, Amagoya was visiting to me. Uh, for some time, and the presentation of today is based on uh, essentially a European Space Agency projects, uh, and so the requirements for the antenna are very specific, uh, normally very, uh, very demanding, and arriving uh, with the metasurface uh, to the same performance of a reflector antenna is uh, very difficult, believe me, is extremely difficult. But we are trying to do it, and some of these uh, uh, antenna are going to be qualified for flight, which is uh, a big success uh, today. Uh, uh, these are the list of uh, collaborators, uh, institution uh, within uh, the European Space Agency. I would like to mention WaveUp, which is a spin-off company formed by uh, my former PhD students, uh, with which uh, we have uh, instituted the uh, joint laboratory at the University of Siena. So it is uh, actually uh, something uh, uh, that uh, allows us uh, also to use our laboratory inside something more specific uh, uh, with the impact uh, on the industry. Uh, I would like just to mention the fact that till 2010, uh, let us say from 96 to 2010, the uh, metasurface uh, was, you were used just with a, a, a periodic structure. So periodic structure, truncated periodic structure maybe, inside antenna. So it is a sort of evolution, was a sort of evolution of the uh, reflect, or let us say, uh, of the uh, FSS structure with elements that are small in terms of wavelength. Uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, microwaves regime, so from 80 gigahertz to 30 gigahertz, let us say, frame in this range. Uh, for instance, uh, low profile dipole antennas, reduction surface wave coupling, improvement of planar antenna efficiency, and so on. Uh, if you uh, look at the last eight years, indeed, there was a, a shift of paradigm in, in place of having uniform elements. The element became non-uniform during uh, the, the, the structure, and this allows uh, to exploit several other 
things uh, like uh, meta filters, meta wide angle impedance matching, deflector, radomes, uh, lenses, transformation optics uh, with flat devices, and uh, so on. Uh, so we have the shift from uniform meta surface to non uniform meta surface, which is actually the topic of today. Concerning with the, the boundary condition, what is important in metasurface, like in metamaterial, is the fact that you can homogenize the, the boundary conditions. And the most simple way to homogenize it uh, is consistent with the fact that the elements are very regular, like a small patch, a round patch, printed over a very thin electric layer. And uh, this can be schematized, uh, modeled by boundary condition like that, uh, the electric field is continuous uh, during uh, the, st uh, the, the passage from one side to the other, while the uh, magnetic field is discontinued in absence of losses, uh, and the relationship between these two is just uh, with the scalar quantity, which is imaginary, and uh, is uh, 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 actually in, uh, a real, with a real part in absence of losses. Uh, if the elements are a little bit more complex, so like element with uh, a cut like that, uh, there you introduce an additional feature, the uh, relationship between uh, the electric field and magnetic field, uh, the jump of magnetic field uh, is uh, tensoral, but nothing changed from the physics point of view. Uh, if uh, indeed uh, you have uh, more than one layer or you have vertical intrusion inclusions into the structure, you can actually have uh, uh, also a discontinuity of magnetic fields provided that the overall element structure is very thin in terms of the wavelength. You have uh, an average electric field from one side to the other that is proportional to the discontinuity of magnetic field and vice versa. And this is structure uh, can be realized by, for instance, a triplet uh, of uh, LM of metasurface, infinitesimal and thin metasurface coupled together, and the overall effect uh, can be described in homogenized sense uh, this way. Now, uh, this uh, thing is very important uh, in order to increase the degrees of freedom because in this particular structure you can match an arbitrary, almost arbitrary incident field uh, and uh, going on the other side uh, with an arbitrary distribution of, of uh, phase. Uh, concerning with the amplitude in this, uh, the, indeed the things are a little bit more complex, but at least the phase you can construct in most, almost in arbitrary sense by using uh, these triplets. This is something that, um, around which several authors uh, uh, worked on. Uh, l let me subdivide the uh, overall phenomena in uh, space wave transformation. So from one side to the other, the field change. And on the uh, other side, you can have an arbitrary beam, a tilted beam, and different polarization, or whatever. Uh, or surface wave uh, uh, modification, surface wave transformation, which in turn can be divided in, in two uh, different uh, uh, branches of activity. One is uh, about the control of the propagation path in order to implement the transformation optics in a planar sense, and the other one is uh, uh, whenever the modulation of the metasurface is along the direction of uh, propagation or uh, it has a component uh, along the direction of propagation uh, of the periodicity. And in this case, uh, actually, you can have a transition to liquid waves directly, and the entire antenna for the surface, metasurface, is itself an antenna. Uh, we will focus uh, this, uh, uh, this talk about uh, this uh, transition and uh, the possibility to create uh, antenna directly using this phenomenon. Uh, the outline of presentation, I will do an introduction on metasurface and next uh, uh, the multiscale design process uh, that we use in order to uh, improve the design of simple broadside beam antenna and high performance antennas uh, with the, which include the multi beam, multi frequency, dual mode, uh, dual polarization, horns, uh, error configurability by tunable materials. Uh, Concerning with the, the basic issue, you can uh, form the basic structural antenna like that. Uh, there is a monopole at the center. The monopole launch a transverse magnetic uh, cylindrical surface wave over the structure. And uh, the surface wave run 
over a sort of average impedance, which is this, around which the element itself that are small in terms of the wavelength uh, uh, create a modulation of impedance. This modulation of impedance interacts uh, with the surface wave, and uh, uh, the surface wave run with, uh, according with this dispersion equation, and for a certain frequency, you have a certain beta, and when the, the lambda of the lambda of the surface wave, 2 pi over beta, match the periodicity, you can get broadside radiation. This uh, expression could be generalized uh, in terms of a local interaction, also if you have a curve, arbitrary curve linear modulation. The modulation is created by changing uh, the uh, dimension of the element, and you can see uh, the holography by probably by uh, the uh, effect of this uh, variation and also by moving, uh, rotating uh, the element in order to control the polarization. So you can control the polarization with the rotation of the element, the modulation with the dimension of the element uh, being the period equal and uh, the uh, alpha with the uh, actually uh, dimension of the, of the modulation. If the modulation is stronger, the alpha and the local alpha is higher uh, for this antenna. Let me remark also the fact that the control of alpha allows uh, some basic difference with respect to reflector ray. Uh, in fact, in reflector ray, you actually control the phase, essentially. While with the metasurface antenna, you can also control the amplitude of the uh, uh, aperture field. Uh, the, aperture of the, the, the amplitude of the aperture of field in the reflector ray could be controlled just with the feed. You cannot do it with the element because it's impenetrable. Here, indeed, you can control the alpha point by point in two dimension. And this is the only structure that allows a, a transition from surface to leak in two dimension, not only in one dimension as usual. Uh, actually, uh, there is obvious, another obvious advantage about the fact that the monopole create a a flat antenna, everything is flat. Uh, while in reflector ray you have a element outside, the feed outside, and this creates more volume into the structure. And the elements are obviously resonance or larger than the one of the, uh, of the metasurface antenna. So these are the main differences. And uh, uh, actually, in, in, in any case, we can take benefits from the uh, design process of a reflector array, especially as concerned with the local periodicity assumption, which we use in order to extract uh, the parameter of the, of the metasurface. Uh, concerning with the polarization, it is just sufficient to have a, an additional parameter to play with, and uh, uh, we use always elements that, that possess two axes of symmetry, because this creates some advantages in the tensor, and uh, <coughs> Oh, sorry, and the various elements uh, have different uh, property, but all of them uh, create uh, a misalignment uh, in the TM wave uh, from the E field and the K vector. It means uh, that uh, the rotation of it uh, uh, can control the uh, minus one component of the field uh, and of the, in terms of polarization. This c allows you to make uh, the streak uh, if you uh, got a, a spiral antenna constructed by Uniform metasurface, uh, you, you get a certain efficiency of the aperture, but if you accompany this uh, uh, structure with the rotation of the element, uh, you actually reduce much the uh, uh, cross-polar components and increase the directivity automatically. So this is the first way to increase uh, the efficiency of an antenna. And uh, this is just uh, you know, designing anisotropy shift, moving from isotropic to anisotropic metasurface, you can get it. Uh, concerning with efficiency, uh, well, this is one of the uh, basic points, uh, how this antenna should be uh, efficient. Uh, so if you illuminate uh, with uh, just a monopole and you get, uh, uh, you should think to have a, a most uniform aperture as possible. This means that whenever you is, uh, get a plane wave incident from uh, down, all the energy goes into the feed uh, despite the fact that there is a background plane, so you should uh, collect all the energy in a feed point. This is a very uh, important aspect uh, because uh, with uh, other type of antenna like uh, patch arrays, you can control this phenomenon very well. 
and uh, in, in this case it's a little bit more difficult uh, but uh, still possible during the time we increase the, our efficiency from this uh, rudimental prototype of 15% of efficiency in uh, to today of 80% of efficiency for the last antenna 40 to be gain. And uh, this is done by using uh, actually design, increasing and improving the design of these antennas. And uh, 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 in order to understand better how to do, you can uh, think uh, to excite a dipole, uh, the monopole, uh, with a certain power. And the balance of power is, uh, include the, the radiation of power directly in the free space with a P feed here. And the part of the energy is going to the surface wave, and the surface wave radiate, part of the surface wave uh, diffract at the end and create a back wave or the other back liquid wave and diffracted field in the free space. All these phenomena in blue and green are undesired. Actually, we uh, need uh, the perfect conversion uh, from liquid wave to surface wave and also a perfect conversion of the input impedance to the surface wave. So we can define three types of uh, uh, efficiency, the feed efficiency as a ratio between the power in the surface wave, the power input, uh, the conversion efficiency, this quantity over this quantity, liquid wave over surface wave, and the aperture tapering the efficiency which is actually defined in a usual way. When the aperture is uniform, the efficiency of aperture is one, and uh, when it uh, decreases, when it is tapered. Uh, actually, the, 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 they are an, an additional efficiency, which is the, due to the ohmic losses, uh, and this is the ratio between uh, the uh, liquid wave in the ideal structure, ideal structure over the, uh, the structure in, in, in affected by the losses, uh, and you get the overall efficiency, which is the product of these four terms here. The most important ones are these two. You can, and uh, this third one depends much by the, uh, how you do the feed. So the, the, the feed is very important, uh, and, for, and uh, these other two depends on how you do the surface. Uh, Whenever uh, you, uh, f just for, for having an idea, if you have no modulation for the surface or the, uh, the power goes into the surface wave, the surface wave diffract everything and the uh, conversion efficiency is zero because you don't convert anything in terms uh, of radiation. While if you get a modulation, you introduce an exponential attenuation, you get a diffraction, you get a, your uh, epsilon tapering decreases, uh, the conversion and free efficiency increases. Uh, but actually, uh, you should have a trade-off uh, for these two quantity in order to maximize the aperture efficiency. And uh, uh, if you do it just using a uniform modulation, since uh, you don't have any degrees of freedom in uh, uh, managing uh, the attenuation constant, uh, uh, your design is very, uh, let us say, dif difficult to, ad to be adjusted. And uh, actually, the only thing that you can do is uh, positioning uh, into the maximum that the product uh, tapering efficient conversion efficiency, and this maximum cannot be more than 58% mathematically, and uh, theoretically, sorry. Uh, you, you notice here that the behavior is uh, quite similar to that of reflector antennas. The aperture efficiency, the tapering efficiency decreases uh, with the uh, increasing uh, radius of the antenna and the uh, tapering uh, efficiency and the conversion efficiency play the same role of the spillover efficiency in reflector antenna and increases and the maximum get 58%. Uh, uh, Actually, whenever you uh, indeed uh, change the design and in place of having a uniform modulation, you change uh, the modulation to small uh, modulation into the larger one and next you go to zero again, actually what you do is you can optimize the profile in such a way that you get a flat uh, aperture distribution of the minus one mode and uh, the uh, aperture go, uh, uh, field goes very rapidly to zero in order to do it, you have to modulate a lot, but you should have the uh, possibility to do it with your elements. And if you, uh, let us say, fix a certain peak of alpha that you can realize, actually you can optimize the profile in such a way that uh, the aperture is uh, almost uniform. 
at the end, uh, you, you get an expression of the product uh, tapering for conversion efficiency, which is something like that. A is the radius of the antenna. Lambda is the wavelength of a free space. You have A over wavelength over A over wavelength plus 2. So whenever you increase, increase, increase the dimension of your antenna, your product aperture efficiency, tapering efficiency could go to uh, unity. And this is uh, something uh, that you can get uh, only with uh, a different modulation. So you have to introduce a slope into the uh, process. Uh, if you increase a lot, uh, actually the, uh, the ohmic losses uh, uh, in increases also because of the length and uh, actually you get uh, a sort of uh, uh, decreasing and so the formula before is not any more valid when you introduce also the uh, ohmic efficiency. This is an example, a practical example of an antenna of 29 dB with a uniform modulation and we get here 30 uh, five percent of aperture efficiency at 8.35 gigahertz. These are done several some years ago uh, for uh, SATCOM application. You have two type of antenna, one for transmission, the other for reception, and you get uh, two different feed, two different dimensions of the element. But actually, the uh, antenna should couple together, and the cross coupling of this is very, very small, like a minus uh, uh, 55 dB, if I remember well. Uh, if you actually do the modulation, indeed, uh, you increase. This is another antenna we fabricated more uh, recently. Uh, the directivity was 39 dB with a gain of 36 at 29.6 gigahertz. Again, the couple is done for. Uh, KA band satellite communication and uh, the L number of elements in this case are 45,000. So imagine to a 45,000 element uh, uh, like that, but the uh, aperture efficiency was 70% uh, with 3 dB losses uh, over a uh, 40 wavelength antenna. So it's a very big antenna. Now, uh, if you uh, actually uh, more recently we, we got over uh, 37 dB gain at 39 dB with 70% of efficiency. And uh, with this element in decreasing the epsilon r, this is another example. And uh, in this plot, you compare, you see the comparison between, for this type of antenna measurement uh, and the, uh, sorry, this is, uh, no, sorry, this is the homogenized impedance uh, versus uh, the uh, fast uh, multiple method analysis element by element and you see that the uh, homogenized impedance uh, model works very well and uh, these are the indeed the comparison between the measurement and the homogenized model which is uh, actually very good uh, uh, very all right okay so recently we got an antenna for 40 dB gain 41.3 directivity so only 1.3 dB losses uh, into the, uh, the structure. And these are the radiation pattern measured by this guy, Gabriele, which is very proud of, about uh, uh, his design. And uh, if you look at the pattern, this is, seems quite similar to what you can obtain by a reflector antenna. It's a big achievement. It's a 40 dB gain antenna. 40 dB gain, not the relativity gain, measured gain. And uh, uh, actually, the problem is how much is the how large is the bandwidth of this antenna when you increase the gain at this level? And this is actually one of the main questions that arise when you uh, talk about metamaterial. Uh, actually, the elements are sub-resonance; they never go into the resonance in these models. So this is a sort of advantage with respect to the bandwidth. However. Uh, you have all, you should always have a sort of synchronism between the wavelength of the surface wave and the periodicity. So when you change the frequency, the dispersion effect of the surface wave, get a, a difference in between these two, and this created the bifurcation, a sort of conical beam that decreased the gain automatically. So uh, it is possible, this phenomenon is uh, clearly associated with the group velocity of the surface wave, uh, and the final formula that you can get is that the bandwidth is uh, equal to, uh, for uniform modulation, almost one times uh, uh, group velocity over C. C is the speed of light, so the group velocity divided by the speed of light, one over the radius in terms of wavelength, which is always less than one over A 
over wavelength. So it is a very simple formula that you can remember well. The relative bandwidth, so the delta omega over omega zero, is uh, always less than the inverse of uh, the radius in terms of wavelength. You cannot do much more than this. You cannot do more than this. Uh, you can uh, approach this uh, when you design your group velocity as uh, close as possible to C. Uh, concerning with uh, non uniform modulation, the constant in front is uh, lightly changed in this uh, optimized version, but actually what is changed much uh, is the product bandwidth gain. So the product bandwidth gain for the uniform modulation is the 22, is always less than 22 A wavelength, and the product bandwidth gate for non-uniform modulation is always less than 50 A wavelength. And this can also be a plot in terms of the gain versus bandwidth in order to establish a physical bound for the gain versus bandwidth for this type of antenna. This physical bound, uh, when you compare it uh, with uh, uh, corporate feed array, is uh, quite good. So you can have almost the same performance of what you can get in terms of bandwidth with large array of 40 dB gain, for instance, uh, when you use a single straight. If you increase the number of straight, uh, the patch array could have a better bandwidth, obviously, but we never try what happened in this antenna when you make a multi-straight, and because it's quite difficult to design. But I think this is a perspective, uh, making multi-level, multi, multi multi-straight um, uh, antenna. Okay, these are the, uh, the checking with the full-wave analysis, so the simple formula that we have seen, and the checking with uh, uh, the measurement that works very well. Uh, till now, the, I'm talking about uh, uniform period. So the period is uniform, the modulation, the amplitude changes. Uh, what happens indeed if you change the period along? You can beat the limit that we have seen before. So you can uh, move in gradually. If you, for instance, uh, change the periodicity from small periodicity to large periodicity toward the external peri periphery, you actually can match uh, the wavelength in different regions of the antenna. So when the frequency change, you have a sort of active region. It's not an active region in the sense of the spiral antenna, for instance, but uh, is always an antenna that works in the conversion between surface wave and, and liquid wave, but in a gradual sense. Changing this, you can obtain a very large bandwidth. But the price that we have to pay is the efficiency. You can decrease the efficiency. And uh, uh, you can see it in the next uh, slide. Yes. Yeah, you, you, we have designed an antenna. This guy da did it, uh, Marco. It's uh, almost uh, flat uh, in gain, but the efficiency is 10% over a huge bandwidth. You can do it. You can play with the periodicity. So. If you increase the gain, you decrease the bandwidth, if you will have a big bandwidth, you have to accomplish about a low gain, but much larger than the one that you get into spiral antenna. Uh, another important thing, when you go up in frequency, actually you have to combat the losses, and the losses are mainly dominated by the dielectric. If you, would like, if you can eliminate the dielectric, you, you have a big advantage. And this is especially important uh, for the antenna that doesn't board the satellite. Uh, if you, uh, 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 so the, the trick in order to do it uh, is to substitute uh, the uh, printed uh, patch with uh, uh, pillars uh, with a small pin with the elliptical cross section. Uh, and this pin has a, a common interface, and the interface with respect to the free space is flat, but the uh, pillars, the small pillars, are placed. Uh, over a step at the ground plane in such a way that you can regulate the height and play with this height. You can modulate the impedance and do reuse, the, in practice, the same type of project design things that you, I've shown before, and you can get the uh, radiation of it uh, with the control of polarization. This is very good because it can be uh, also uh, printed by 
uh, uh, 3D uh, printers, uh, and uh, there's a big advantage today. Uh, these are the uh, Beforming network that was designed by David Gonzalez and uh, Ren, and these are the uh, final measurements uh, that are quite good. This, uh, this uh, s uh, solution, technological solution, can be scaled up to 300 gigahertz. Uh, these are the, uh, the, the pro the design done in JPL, with the, with, in cooperation with JPL at 300 gigahertz uh, by David. The uh, numerical results show the same difference between isotropic and isotropic. The anisotropic case get a much higher efficiency, uh, but they, they have for now constructed only the isotropic surface uh, and the use of it for, is for nanosatellite, for CubeSat, to, uh, for sensor in CubeSat. And uh, these are the uh, design done by the fabrication done in JPL. Now, what about the, uh, the multi-scale design process? So if you uh, would like to, uh, to design a shaped beam, for instance, or you can control multi-beams or doing something like that, uh, more sophisticated performance for your antenna, actually you should uh, go into a design process uh, which is uh, quite uh, complex. Uh, the uh, most uh, simple, let us say, complication is uh, tilting the beam. Tilting the beam can be done by changing the holography from uh, the spiral into an elliptical spiral. And uh, uh, actually, uh, this uh, allows you to uh, reuse the conceptual uh, aspect of the physics uh, just uh, uh, making uh, the global interaction in terms of local interaction of a cylindrical wave uh, with uh, a rectilinear modulation. And this allows uh, to use a sort of canonical problems that match uh, the local uh, structure and from which we can extract uh, the parameter of local alpha and local beta. So, uh, actually, you can control local alpha and local beta by just by this. And this is not only valid for elliptical. You can change the holography and change the local modulation and change the local alpha and local beta at your uh, will uh, with certain uh, limitation, but uh, with uh, a lot of degrees of freedom. So, actually, you can design the, the sheet impedance over ground slab. So, this sheet impedance here. Uh, in terms of this variable modulation and the fast varying uh, contribution of the modulation in phase uh, and the slow varying contribution that actually uh, get, uh, get the control of the polarization. This one controls the fine tuning of, be of beta over the average uh, and this control the alpha of a row. So with this, you control the several parameters, but most important things that you can define global modes with that. So with, uh, with the use of the local rectilinear mode, you can construct global modes that run over the surface. So you have actually zero mode. This is what happened for the tilted beam antenna. You have a zero mode, which is quite similar to zero mode in terms of the current. So the current of the antenna over the zero mode, which are quite similar of the uh, current associated with uh, uh, the uh, surface wave that run over the average surface. Next, you have the minus one mode, which is the one that you use for radiation, and uh, that has a spectrum which is concentrated in the spot being here, and the mode plus one. So this is the space, and this is the spectrum. You see that the spectrum is very regular. So you get a spectrum here, which is uh, outside the visible region. Visible region is uh, in uh, uh, white here. Uh, the, since this is very similar to the surface wave, this spot uh, is uh, outside the visible region. So you don't see it when you get uh, into the far field. What you see is only the minus one mode. And this one is plus one mode, again, is uh, structure like that. If you get, get into uh, some uh, very tilted beam, what, you can, uh, what can happen is the minus two mode have a portion inside the visible region. This creates some uh, lateral lobes, and you have to check and control it uh, when you get the antenna design. 
and next to plus two mode you never do any problem. So you, you should control the minus two mode. But the, the, the beauty of this uh, approach is not on the fact that they get some physics inside, but you can use this mode as a characteristic mode inside the method of moments and check it and uh, uh, couple it uh, with the true feed. And so the, the coupling coefficient of the modes with the feed could be calculated by imposing uh, the integral equation uh, in terms of homogenized boundary conditions. And this is what uh, we are doing now. And uh, uh, actually, if you compare this, uh, all these modes, uh, you can see the trace. And uh, minus two modes is the, the only one that uh, may give you a problem. Uh, but uh, if you think to have a, a modulated beam, you have to control carefully all these modes that are given in uh, closed form. So all these modes are given in closed form if you make, if you make the uh, uh, homogenized uh, approach. Uh, actually, uh, if you would like at the end to schematize the problem in terms of the multi-scale, this is our big antenna, like 40 wavelength. Each element is of the order of lambda over 10, sometimes, sometimes less, but in the range of lambda over 5 or lambda over 10. And each element normally should be discretized in a moment, method of moment with elements of lambda over 100. So you should start from 30 wavelength or more, 40 wavelength, from 40 wavelength to land over 100. So it's a, an extreme huge range that creates normally instability in your method of moment. So problem of uh, inversion. So you have to use the trick to, to, to study this antenna with the method of moment. The, f uh, the minimum dimension, land over 10, normally is discretized by raw wilton grissom basis function, but we never use uh, this raw wilton grissom basis function in order to study all the problem because uh, we will go into million unknown problems. This is an, a, a sketch uh, that you can have uh, for a uh, complex antenna. So what we can do is uh, in the mesoscale, which is the scale actually of the global modulation, we use the homogenization approach. Uh, and uh, the homogenization approach is given in terms of a closed form adiatomatic modes, but these are only valid for uh, elementary sources. Uh, but we use the same mode inside uh, the method of moment, homogenized method of moment with a true source, uh, with a true feed, because otherwise we should not be able to estimate uh, the uh, efficiency of the feed, which is a, a quite important uh, parameter. Uh, if you, if you look in this, in this atomic scale, we use our wilton business function, but only in order to extract the local parameter. So in a periodicity environment, uh, and as you, as you know, the periodicity environment allows you to uh, make a very, very uh, fast calculation, and these are in order to construct a database on which to fish out the impedance that you wish. And, uh, the molecular scale, uh, scale is intended on grouping raw wilton basis function into synthetic function, so you group it on the use of the periodicity assumption, you get into, the, in, in, into synthetic function, and you go into the macro scale by using a fast uh, multiple method. All these uh, uh, software have been constructed by ourselves, uh, nothing is uh, done by conventional general purpose software because when you go into this dimension, they're almost useless. They are very useful when you go from, uh, for example, CST or FICO or uh, uh, other software are extremely useful in the range of wavelength that goes uh, from, uh, let us say, five wavelength or less into the uh, 20 wavelength. Uh, but when you overcome 20 wavelength, you would like to have a 40 wavelength antenna. You design it, you cannot do it with a general purpose for software. And you, you need uh, something uh, which is constructed purposely with this technique. So if you look at this uh, global uh, feature, you have an objective aperture field, you get into the other body mode synthesis, uh, you check with the uh, uh, characteristic MOM, uh, done with the uh, characteristic basis function. This is a few minutes, uh, this is a few seconds, it's almost closed form, but does not include the feed. This is uh, the few minutes. And then next, you go 
uh, after designing the antenna into a database uh, which is constructed with several elements. Uh, you decide which is the element, etc. And finally, you can check with the uh, Fourier, uh, with the uh, synthetic function plus fast multiple method. This is the overall design process. Uh, and uh, this allows you to make uh, some antenna that uh, go like that is the profile of an, an antenna that is used for uh, uh, download from the uh, low orbit satellite. Uh, the satellite uh, uh, needs uh, to illuminate uh, the Earth, uh, the surface of the Earth, with the same power density. And uh, this uh, gets you a profile like that. Uh, and uh, you can gain uh, the other dimension by rotating the antenna. So the antenna is uh, connected with, uh, with the rotation system, um, but the uh, single minus one mode has a, a, a um, pattern like that. And uh, this is the, the one that we have designed. Uh, this is a comparison between uh, uh, this method and, and uh, complete the method moment for wave analysis done by two different persons. Uh, I'm not, no, sorry. This is the uh, adiabatic mode done by an elementary dipole, so close form with respect to the characteristic mode using uh, the um, homogenized approach. And the, the comparison is quite good. And uh, actually, this is indeed uh, the comparison with respect to the measurement. Uh, the measurement uh, are not quite good here. At the beginning, we believe, uh, this is the UV plane, uh, we believe at the beginning that was due to the fact that the uh, surface was not perfectly flat. There was a little bit no flat, but actually it was not there. The reason was the mode minus two. So uh, actually there is an imbalance of the feed because the feed should be perfectly balanced. It was not just a single uh, dipole in this case, but it was a web guide with uh, two ports uh, calibrated. If you have a, a certain dissymmetry in between the two ports, uh, the modes a couple more to, to the minus two mode to the, to the first mode and create this problem here. And actually now we are trying to perfectionate the, the design and the fabrication of the feed. Um, actually, here indeed, uh, uh, you make the, the modeling. Uh, the modeling is done of the, the extraction of the parameter uh, with the database. The database is constructed by using a periodicity approach uh, and uh, the periodic Green's function for the method of moment. Uh, this is something that you can also use some trick for the uh, the deformation, the zoom of the element uh, in order to speed up the construction of the database. And uh, uh, I showed you, you get, uh, we have constructed for now database for this particular element uh, also because we, should, we would like to compare the performance of the element uh, in the various cases. Uh, and uh, this table uh, was required by the uh, European Space Agency in order to uh, clarify which are the benefits uh, or the difficulties of the various elements in terms of para, uh, anisotropic control, range of the average uh, bandwidth sensitivity to the tolerances and loss in the materials. Now, uh, with this method you can do a little bit better than what uh, we had done till now. For instance, uh, sharing aperture for dual beam. So uh, the idea is uh, to superimpose uh, the two surfaces uh, and get the two beams with a single point source uh, or with a couple of point sources. Uh, this is extremely useful for uh, several applications. You can do it obviously also partitioning uh, the aperture, so attributing uh, one piece of the aperture to one beam, but this reduces much uh, the uh, efficiency of the aperture and mostly you introduce uh, some uh, um, uh, cross polar level lobes and also lateral lobes uh, that are not uh, compliant with some requirement uh, and here indeed uh, you get uh, sorry uh, you get uh, sorry the uh, superposition of the aperture that clean up very much uh, the beam. So you, what you do is actually you design one beam, 
an impedance, design the other beam, you superimpose the impedance mathematically, this is the basic issue, next you need some optimization, and you get uh, the uh, uh, beam for each point source, and it works uh, quite well. The problem is that uh, you, don't, you cannot reach the level of uh, aperture efficiency for the single beam of the previous case because there is a certain coupling of the beam, but for sure with respect to this uh, rudimental approach in which you share the aperture, this is much better. And uh, uh, you can also do it uh, by using different point sources. Uh, and uh, uh, actually this is much more useful because you excite one beam with uh, each point source. So you ex with this, you excite a beam in this direction, with this in this direction, this in this direction, etc. So for each beam, you, for each point source, uh, you design a beam. Uh, these are the, some uh, experimental validation done by David Gonzalez. Uh, and uh, here you see a couple of beams with a single point source. Uh, here indeed, uh, uh, we use uh, the same approach, uh, but for making uh, an antenna which works with two, f two frequencies. So on one frequency, you have a beam. The other frequency, you have another beam and uh, with a good efficiency for the two beams. Uh, and uh, you do it uh, and just superimposing uh, the two holography and making the analysis we have seen before. And uh, for one of that, uh, you get uh, uh, this result uh, for an antenna 32 gigahertz and 26.25 gigahertz. And these frequencies are something that uh, works in KIA band for SATCOM. And, uh, uh, actually, this is the, the strange holography you can get. Uh, there is uh, some lateral lobes that is a little bit out of our control, and this again depends from the minus two mode. So, because at the, this large distance, uh, one minus two mode goes into influ uh, to get influence on the other frequency. And uh, this is something that we have not yet overcome, we, it is a difficulty that we have tried to control. Another interesting story is about the dual pole. Dual pole means uh, the dual mode, so you should uh, go into the simultaneous excitation of that first TA mode and the first TA, uh, the dominant TA mode and the first TA mode. The trick is uh, to get an average impedance whose product is uh, uh, equal to the square uh, of product of the reactance minus uh, uh, z squared, z is the 377 ohm. So this product here should be like that in the average. And uh, this could be done in a larger as possible range of frequency. And uh, actually, this can be done by using this element, the ellipses, with a, a cross slot. And uh, one of the arm of the slot uh, regulate the T, the other one for the TM, and you can control better the two uh, phase velocity, and you lock these two phase velocity in a certain bandwidth, and uh, actually provided to have a, a good feed. This was designed by Amagoya Telekea in, uh, in U, UPNA. This uh, was the final antenna. The results are quite nice. Uh, Unfortunately, the aperture efficiency is 33% and the antenna efficiency is 24%, but it works for dual pole. So um, this technique is good. The bandwidth uh, is not very well controllable. The uh, aperture efficiency is n probably controllable, but uh, uh, it, it is a critical design, very, very difficult design. Uh, uh, the same trick about the product of the two impedance equal to minus z square can be also used in order to simulate, to emulate uh, the corrugated horn by using a very, very thin surfaces. So uh, these are the uh, elements that you can use uh, over the surface. Uh, this is uh, the construction. It's a very thin uh, layer, uh, which is planar, and next is uh, just uh, rounded inside uh, the conical walls. So uh, this is done by MBG. The realization was done by MBG. The design was done by us with uh, an optimization done by the body revolution code. We have another code about body revolution in order to design it. And uh, uh, actually, we get uh, some uh, preliminary results a couple of years ago that was not good and were not sufficient in terms uh, of the 
cross pole. You know, when you would like to design a corrugated horn, you need as lower as possible. You do it because you 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 need a very very pure polarization. So the cross pole should be less than let us say minus 25 dB at least. Here it is good in in the part of the bandwidth, but only in overall bandwidth that was set up from 11 to 12 2.2, and actually. European Space Agency was not uh, accomplished about uh, the optimization, so we came back to the theory. So we studied just uh, the conical modes into an infinite structure, and we discovered a very old paper by uh, Peter Clericourts that actually discovered one of the modes of the conical uh, impedance surface, uh, thank you much, uh, that gets uh, into a very good separation of the dispersion equation, and uh, again using these, uh, but with uh, a component of the tensor which is going uh, like one over r and the other as uh, r, where r is the distance with respect uh, to the uh, vertex of the cone. If you do like that and you respect uh, this uh, condition, actually you have a perfectly polarized mode. So uh, you, we have a, a try to replicate uh, these uh, conditions uh, by using uh, uh, these uh, impedance, uh, local periodic problems, uh, by using a local k vector and uh, synthesize the element in this way. Uh, the difficulty that we have uh, uh, found in doing that is that you need to make a triangular grid, otherwise there is a sort of a phase rumor that, uh, mm, uh, uh, let us say, uh, deteriorate the performance a lot. But if you get this uh, triangular mesh, local triangular mesh, in order to extract it, uh, you can simulate uh, the structure and you get a very good uh, performance in, in terms of uh, uh, cross pole. These are some results. Uh, this is the realization. And the new measurement uh, was actually very good. So minus uh, 25 dB of cross pole. And this is uh, something uh, that never uh, uh, happen so easily. And this is just uh, replicating uh, the clericot mode, not uh, making any optimization. When we did the optimization, we got, we got worse results. So, so we came back to the theory and we get better results than before. I don't know if uh, starting with this point we can improve elsewhere. Uh, another another thing is about uh, uh, tilting the beam. This is very useful for big reflector in order to uh, render sometimes you need to focus uh, in one point uh, by using uh, this configuration of horns, uh, but you can do it flat with the obvious uh, mechanical advantages, uh, just uh, tilting the beam, and this tilt could be done by using three layer, so a bionisotropic metasurface. Uh, these three layer are constructed by particular uh, type of structure that goes gradually from inductive to capacitive without any jump and this is a critical point you should do it uh, very regularly if you jump uh, you encounter some phase uh, mistake and uh, this is the final uh, measurement that gets uh, uh, 7 uh, degrees uh, no 15 degrees uh, sorry of, uh, of shifting and also uh, increase the directivity, so we also compensate a little bit the, say, the phase, so like a, a horn, a lens in the horns. So, tilting and compensating the phase. So, now for the last two minutes, I would like to uh, uh, to uh, so some some work about uh, uh, beam scanning. Uh, the beam scanning uh, is divided in beam hopping and agility, and uh, this normally requires the very uh, fast switching uh, and uh, or if you would like to just moving the beam gradually in order to make a, a slow tracking uh, for for example satellite tracking from the earth uh, you can also accomplish a uh, time of uh, reconfigurability of the order of milliseconds uh, while here you do nanoseconds so uh, in this time of variation are compatible with the liquid crystal uh, technology. You know liquid crystal have been constructed by TV, so for the optics. Uh, when you move it in the frequency, in the microwave range, uh, actually you encounter a lot of difficulties, uh, uh, 
but uh, you can uh, 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 actually have the benefits that you can change the epsilon r, and uh, this change of epsilon r change the phase velocity of the surface wave, so change its wavelength, and uh, uh, you can create a scan also with a fixed uh, periodicity. So you get a fixed periodicity, you change uh, the epsilon r by simple continuous voltage change, so with only one parameter, and with this uh, you, you, you make the scanning. And we have tried to propose this to uh, European Space Agency with this uh, particular uh, <coughs> A structure in which uh, you have a, a slab, and so, uh, on the top of the slab uh, you have a metal surface, a metal surface uh, which is uh, actually uh, uh, get a different uh, uh, isofrequency dispersion curves uh, when you change uh, the uh, uh, frequency over a different orientation, and the metal surface uh, allows to. Uh, uh, let us say, uh, moving uh, the characteristic frequencies uh, of the surface wave uh, from 500 gigahertz uh, that is uh, constitutive of the liquid crystal itself into a micro range. So you should uh, uh, use it, uh, otherwise you cannot design it at microwaves. And with this, uh, different orientation of the molecule of the liquid crystal get different uh, uh, modulation of the is a frequency dispersion curves, uh, and this gets. Uh, sorry, I'm going back. So, and uh, if you introduce a modulation like that, you can scan. This is what I mentioned before, and these are numerical results uh, that done by one dimension. This is not three dimension; it's one dimension, and you can get a different scan by using different uh, voltage. The beauty of this is that you use only one voltage gap, and we realize it uh, by using a multi strat structure in which you get a horn, and the horn get in a sieve, uh, uh, sieve technology reflection, the reflection get a plane wave, the plane wave coupled on the top floor, and you have the metal surface on top, and in between this layer and this you have a liquid crystal and the biasing, and uh, you get uh, actually first the measurement of the uh, dielectric constant and the tangent loss uh, in order to see which is the range of variability of the dielectric. Uh, and you see that this variability have a knee here uh, around the 5 volt uh, and when you get uh, the antenna, uh, this is the uh, fixed frequency, no biasing, uh, and here you get the variation uh, from 0 to 50 volt, uh, and you see that due to this uh, phenomenon of a knee, uh, you have uh, an appreciable change uh, of 7 degrees uh, uh, from uh, changing from 0 to 10 volt, uh, and uh, if you increase uh, more, you don't change anymore. So this is compatible with the uh, uh, variation of the beam is around uh, 7 degrees, uh, 8 degrees. Uh, that is completely out from what uh, the European Space Agency asked us, actually asked much more, 20 degrees. This is uh, the maximum that we did. And uh, okay, uh, I, I think that uh, I finish here. And I would like just to emphasize the fact that this type of antenna is starting to become competitive with other technology. Uh, the reconfigurability is still a problem, but uh, the what I suggest uh, is probably to go into the switch more than into the liquid crystal with a continuous variable. The beauty of the liquid crystal is uh, that you can use only one parameter for making the vertical scan, and this is quite uh, useful and important. But, I mean, if you would like to increase the, the capability, you should go into the switches. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Christoph. If I know, great talk and a beautiful pizza, by the way. <laughs> um, I have a basic question. Uh, you, you approach these metasurfaces in the perspective of a surface impedance. Mm -hmm. And the surface impedance is a 2 by 2 tensor, right? Mm -hmm. 
So in contrast to susceptibility approaches where you have three by three tensors, mm -hmm. are you not missing opportunities in normal polarization currents and then functionalities in your applications in the end of the day? Yes, yes. Uh, this is a very good question. Actually, uh, since we use always a background plane, what we notice is if you make a bionisotropic layer over ground plane, actually you don't gain much because the tangential fields are always two by two. So actually it may be that uh, you can increase the bandwidth, for instance, uh, for a single approach. This may be a possibility, but it's not so important when you, as when you go into the transmission. For the transmission is fundamental. That I agree perfectly. Yes, yes, for dual mode is also, for dual mode should be very interesting, yes. But for uh, dual mode you have a, a lot of other problems. Uh, the problems for dual mode is that you can match the frequency in one direction, when you go in the other direction there's mismatch a bit. So this is the main problem. Thank you much. Filippo. Filippo. Oh, thank you for this beautiful presentation, I mean, it was fantastic. And uh, also stressing the importance of understanding the theory and the celebration of leaky weights, okay? But my question is, uh, I mean, I'm very impressed by this 40 dB antenna gain. I mean, as, uh, I know what it means, it's, it's, uh, it's very impressive. What kind of sub, sub I, I guess rigidity must be a very important factor. Mm -hmm. So what kind of substrate have you used? In that case, this is a very important question. Uh, actually, uh, one of the basic fact is that uh, whenever you would like to use, uh, uh, it's much easier to design the antenna with higher permittivity, like 9.8. But if you do it and you buy the substrate, uh, the substrate exhibits a, a small uh, anisotropy, and this anisotropy affects the performance when you go in this level. Uh, this is a big problem. The second one is that lowering the epsilon r uh, mitigates this fact of the anisotropy of the substrate and mostly increase the bandwidth. So, uh, but the problem of a lower substrate is the element becomes a little bit larger because the dielectric is uh, less. So if the elements become larger, you have less uh, sampling of the continuous fault. So the homogenization approach is a little bit less valid. So you should change uh, the elements in order to load l more. But when you change the, the element, for instance, uh, from the ellipses into the double anchors, you can get very accurate uh, into the realization because the tolerances are play fundamental roles. So there are several things uh, that we have overcome and learned uh, gradually. But at the end, uh, the last substrate was epsilon r equal to 3 for the 40 dB antenna. And the thickness, one, mil one millimeter, uh, 30 gigahertz. Uh, and how do you compare these two other kind, similar leaky wave antennas, like a radial line slot antenna, for example, that can be fully metal and very rigid at the same time? Yes, yes, yes. That's good. Uh, good question. The problem of the uh, antenna with the uh, RLSA is that uh, the elements are resonant. So you have an additional restriction of bandwidth, but you don't have it because they are, the elements are sub-resonant. Normally, this works with a larger bandwidth with respect to the RLSA. The RLSA has the ability to be uh, also without any uh, dielectric inside. This is a good. Uh, could be an advantage uh, at very high frequency that could be cal uh, let us counterbalance uh, by the only metal structure that I showed before, which is actually more usable at higher frequency. Uh, but there is another problem for the RLSA, uh, which is actually the higher order mode uh, much less controllable with respect to this. When you get into shaping beam, forget the RLSA. While well, here you can do it, shape it being like that. Any other question? Yes.
Yeah, very good question. Uh, sorry, uh, the question was, uh, you, you got with this uh, liquid crystal structure seven degrees uh, of uh, shifted mean. This was the first attempt, actually. Uh, this is not sufficient at all. No good. <laughs> I agree. Uh, in most of the application, the space for improving, there is. Uh, several uh, companies are looking at uh, perfectionating liquid crystal, not in the optical region, but in the microwave. So the Merck, for instance, uh, is a big uh, provider of uh, substrate uh, for liquid crystal in uh, liquid crystal display uh, uh, to, to Samsung. And uh, uh, they are looking at the microwave frequency now. There was a nice presentation last uh, uh, AP symposium. And uh, if you get into the problem losses, uh, the problem of speed, uh, and uh, the problem of sensitivity, that now is almost nothing. You can go from 2.5 to 3.3, that's it. And you cannot do much. What you can do is uh, lowering uh, the stray. So if you use, a, let us say, to one micron of, of liquid crystal, or 100 micron, you get a more sensitivity. But the problem that you decrease the bandwidth, and uh, uh, your instantaneous bandwidth uh, become diffi difficult to control. So seven degrees uh, is compatible with the instantaneous bandwidth compensation, which is uh, quite another issue there. Thank you for this question. Maybe we have time for one last question, if any. OK. Thank you so much for the impressive presentation. Uh, uh, you have mentioned that uh, some of your designs were space qualified. Were you talking about the all metal configuration uh, or the substrate based configuration as well? Very, very good question. We tried uh, to make the qualification, uh, frankly speaking, for the dielectric uh, by using grounding. But one of the mo most important problems is the grounding because. Uh, but the grounding is very easy when you get slots, not easy when you get a patch, but the patch is better than the slots uh, from design point of view. So the grounding uh, uh, was the main issue. So at the end, we go into the qualification of the only metal while uh, uh, we are trying still to get into the qualification of the uh, dielectric uh, structure because of, of this problem of the grounding. Okay, so uh, let's thank again Stefano for its very inspiring talk and uh, mm. let's move to the coffee break. Thank you.